Dear students, in the previous lecture, I talked about the three different ecosystems, atmospheric, terrestrial, on surface and below the surface when it came to microbes. So today let us dive further into all these three of them and look at the major phenomena that uh, happen in these three different uh, types of water habitats, aquatic habitats. Now one thing I want to mention that typically in a microbiology course you would learn about different microbes that are found in soil, microbes that are found in air and microbes that are found in groundwater. Now, the interesting thing is that as we have developed new tools, we are realizing the immense diversity of microbes present in all of these three aquatic ecosystems. And the other part we are noticing is that a lot of them are common to each other because the soil microbes can get aerosolized and then can become airborne. Similarly, the airborne microbes can wash away in rain and then become terrestrial or surface water microbiome. So, because of the interconnection and the uh, common uh, microbes that they share with each other, many many uh, environmental microbiologists are of the opinion that there is no there is less point in memorizing the details of the microbes that are found in different environment, but there is more it is more important to understand the geographical, the chemical and the physical factors and the different nutrient cycles that actually impact the microbial growth, population and activity in these ecosystems. So once we have that, we can use any high throughput amplitude consequencing based techniques or metagenomics based techniques and then we can understand what is present and get an idea of what they are doing, right. Okay, so now let us go ahead and dive into the three ecosystems and see what are the major phenomena there. Okay, so in this slide on the left panel, you have this dirty looking plate and if and nothing else look here, this is an auger plate by the way, very well labeled and there are at least um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different kinds of microbial communities growing. So there is this black mold kind of fung uh, fungus kind of community. This looks like colony from bacteria and same thing some interesting stuff growing here. This is green so it might be um, phototrophic. Now this all uh, this is a culture of airborne microbes. So this is a culture of bio aerosol captured from air. So look here the microbes that are invisible in the air because you know their habitat their bio aerosol is really tiny when they get a larger habitat to live like this auger plate they are visible and so you can just see the morphological diversity here. Now on the right panel we have a very basic schematic of how the microbes are processed from air to terra. So let us start from plants they have the root activity the effect and the chemical processes in earth they affect the surface uh, sorry the soil microbiology and then these microbes are released into the air and here we have carboxylic acid, we have carbon dioxide so there is a chemical reactions also happening but they are released into the air and then they use whatever nutrients they can find in the air and eventually find themselves back in the soil. So this is a little more detailed diagram and I think more helpful. So let us say we have a bacteria in the air or microbes in the air, some of them would get disinfected by the sunlight itself you know UV rays kills microbes, some microbes and the way it does that is UV uh, creates thymine thymine dimers in the genetic material of any m um, microbe that it can and when that happens the microbe cannot replicate and thus it, uh, its progenies are no longer formed and it dies a natural death and the community suffers, the population suffers. So some of them would actually uh, die off because of the UV irradiation, some of them will actually do the job of reflecting the UV irradiation back into the atmosphere. But here we have bacteria happily floating swimming in the air. Because of their small size they can uh, persist and subsist in air for a really long time, alive or dead. It, did, it would take them long time to come and settle to the earth's surface. So, but it does happen and this is called dry deposition. So when they naturally succumb to gravity and come down to earth, it is dry deposition. And then we have the other directional movement also where we have emission of terrestrial microbiome. So the terrestrial microbes here, remember uh, in the previous lecture I talked about a human being walking into the room and uh, the moment we walk in the room it is like the microbes are just being shed from us and entering the air and does not happen just when we walk into the room in fact wherever we go we do this we are continually shedding the microbes and we are continually being exposed to environmental microbes and 
Similarly, the earth is also in a continual equilibrium in which it is sending the microbes to the air and the air is allowing dry deposition of microbes to happen. So, this emission of microbes will allow the microbes to go all the way to the clouds definitely depending on the local weather and atmospheric conditions. But once it has reached the clouds here it will form very stable bioaerosols. It can help the clouds formation also we we'll talked about nucleation in the previous class. And then what we have is wet deposition let us say there is rain. So, these microbes can be embedded in the rain particles and they will come down and they will deposit. Um, if you ask me if this is the reason why people talk about do not um, bathe in rain you will fall sick. I am not sure that is the reason but the might be. Not remember not all microbes are bad for health so please do not um, worry before you bathe in the rain if you like doing that kind of stuff. Alrighty and next we have CCN emission. So, this is also another route through which the microbes can get aerosolized. Now, one very obvious um, method for microbes to get aerosolized that we have not talked about yet is human activities. Especially when it comes to public health this is very very important. So, think about a person who is sick let us say I have flu I am sick and I go sneezing everywhere because that is one of the symptoms. Every time I sneeze I am emit, I'm emitting the aerosols that have the flu virus and with these and depending on the size of the aerosol depending on their characteristic physical chemical characteristics they will persist in the environment for some time and any human being or any being uh, who comes in contact with these aerosols will receive the virus and sometimes it does not have to be just uh, directly received but can deposit on a fomite and then the human being can pick up from the fomite. So, fomite is any surface that has a pathogen and when we come in touch with the pathogen it makes us sick. So, we I mean, in this diagram we are not considering that but in context of public health this is very very important and uh, I would like to mention here one of the studies that happened at Virginia Tech some years ago where they looked at how viral pathogens persist in air in bio aerosols. And the question they were trying to target was um, why is the flu season in India the rainy season, the hot and humid season whereas the flu season in North American countries is the winter season when it is dry and cold. So, remember with flu we are talking about viral flus and in flu uh, we, as we know that these viruses can travel really long distances. So, go back to previous lecture and notice that how I talked about the microbes especially the flu virus traveling from one end of the world to the other end diametrically opposite end of the world. So, we know that they can persist really long, but why is the seasonality present in the uh, flu virus epidemics and outbreaks and the answer that they proposed and they um, had evidence in support of was that the persistence of virus in these bioaerosols depends on the weather conditions. So, if there is more humidity like you notice here in the clouds and the temperature is hot or humid they will live longer. The, in, in case of virus we do not talk of life we talk of integrity the integrity of viral particles would, serve, would be longer would survive longer. And in, uh, I, on the other hand if it is uh, humid and cold not so much. If it is dry and hot not so much the proteins will get uh, desiccated and they will lose their integrity. But if it is cold and dry the other end of the spectrum the viral persistence will be very high. So, we do know now that where the bacteria where the virus where the microbes are going and what conditions we have in the air determines how long they will survive and this is very very important from public health perspective. And here I will briefly mention another research that is happening in again in North America where they are looking at how the city's bio aerosol is determined by different activities that are happening. For example, the wind blowing from ocean will bring in some bio aerosols, will bring in some microbial communities and if I have a sewage treatment plant that is undergoing severe aeration in their active research process nearby that will allow some kind of bio aerosols to be emitted. Now, there are two microbial community uh, bio, uh, two different types of um, bio aerosol systems interacting with each other and how that would affect the net bio aerosol community structure microbial community structure and bio aerosols for that shore for that region. So, now there is a lot of research happening and even though it sounds like ok let us look at more concentrated form of pathogens present in surface water present in our food in our fomites before we go to air, but we are realizing that the airborne transmission is very very important alrighty. So, let us move to now the aquatic system. 
So, here I have a profile, a cross sectional profile of uh, a, a surface water body and please look carefully. Now, from E to E is the perennially uh, permanently flooded region and from D to D the line where it says low water. So, this is the minimum amount of water that we expect that will be present throughout the year. So, even in summer and dry seasons it should be present. Average water is what will be present on, on, on average and then high water is during the flood. Now, if you look at the profile you notice that we have plant like structures growing from um, definitely in below C to C, definitely below D to D and somewhat below E to E. But then in this particular region there is nothing, there is no growth. This is the unconsolidated bottom. So, we do not have any um, major vegetation growing in this region. And one of the very simple reason is that the question is how uh, deep does the light go to allow the vegetation to grow. Now, because this is unconsolidated bottom, there are very interesting things that might be happening on the physical process level and which will be affecting the microbial community. So, and then we have between the low water, average water and high water, we have the consolidated region. We call anything uh, below E as aquatic bed and there are different names here which I encourage you to take a look at. So, when we talk of high water, the um, that is the flood zone. Any place until uh, where the high water will go is called the lacustrine system, ecosystem and the microbiology of this system is very unique. Now, notice here in some parts here between average and high, they are the parts of the soil, they are the parts even in the terms of water when it is, there is flood uh, that have only seasonal presence of uh, water, pre only seasonal presence of flood. And thus, the microbes that survive here or the variation they undergo through the air would be different than between D and E layers where there is always water present and definitely in the unconsolidated bottom where they have very little root activity and very little um, vegetation, but lot of physical processes governing this part, lot of sedimentation. So, take some time to go through this uh, diagram and learn the names of different parts of a river system of a surface water system alrighty. So, when we talk of surface water as I have mentioned in the previous lecture we are very very interested in public health because that is still the major source of drinking water for most communities across the world. So, here are some list of diseases that are water related and um, in the subsequent lectures when I talk of drinking water microbiology I will go through them and many more in detail. So, this is just for your information and the chief one that we have mentioned them here are the Vibrio cholera that causes cholera and by the way in, in our world as I am recording right now there is a very bad cholera outbreak in Yemen which is a refugee crisis. So, this is very relevant um, and then we have salmonella which causes typhoid a part of a type of uh, salmonella they cause typhoid and this is very big issue in India and then we have shigella which causes dysentery. This is again another big problem in our country and then we have E. coli and there are particular types of E. coli O148, O157, O124 that causes acute diarrhea and gastroenteritis. So, these are only some of the water related diseases there are many more, but we are very interested when we are talking of surface water microbiology we are very interested in them. In fact, um, in our regulations the pathogens we look for are we look for E. coli kind of coliforms we look at shigella salmonella. So, if they are present we know that water is not safe, we will we do not go ahead and do detection for giardia, cryptospodia or cholera on a regular level. So, these are the most important from regulatory perspective also. Okay, now, let us look at the water microbiology in surface. So, this is very nice diagram. So, look here in oceans we have certain amount of pathogens, some of them escape into air through evaporation and then precipitate back. Some of them reach the atmosphere in the clouds, they precipitate on land, some of them are trapped in ice and in fact, the ones that are trapped in ice is how we tell a lot about ecosystems of past. So, we can drill cores and we can see how, what microbes are trapped from thousands of years ago and then get an idea of what the air quality was, what the water quality was, how did the world look like then. And then we have some that percolate down in the groundwater, we will talk about them and then there is lot of microbial activity that happens around root. 
So, um, in one of the previous lectures, I talked about the root microbiome, the bacteria that fungus and bacteria and other microbes that live with the plants in the root system and they have lot of root activity going on and then we have evapotranspiration. So, you notice that the microbes follow the water cycle and this is because remember the cellular membrane of water is perf uh, cellular membrane of a microbe in general is perfect for it to survive in water based system. Alrighty, this is a very wonderful cartoon that I took from uh, one of the papers and I like this because whenever we do analysis of surface water um, microbiology and ecosystem, we notice that it has uh, it represents or we notice that it is a collection of micro microbes from very different sources. So, for example, this cartoon says that 21 percent is from raccoon, 15 percent from human, 13 percent from dog, 32 percent from waterfall, 17 percent we cannot do. So, we, we do not know. So, now because of our metagenomics, we can actually do this kind of analysis and then we can do a PCOA analysis, principal coordinate analysis and we can get an idea of uh, what percentage of the microbes match different sources and we can get an idea ok waterfall is the major cause of contamination there is also some human con uh, contribution in this particular sample. In India most of the uh, water samples in surface we are more likely to see a very high contribution of human um, just because of our overpopulation definitely very little raccoon. Alrighty, so now let us see how the uh, human activities animal activities affect um, microbes in our environment. So, this is a very common sight in India and you must see this every now and then if you travel any bit outside the city, sometimes even within the city. This is we have uh, animals grazing, interacting with the water bodies and pooing here and releasing their microbiome into the water. So, the water will take the animal fecal matter, the animal skin mat microbes and, um, and it, the microbial community of the water will change. This might you know go into the f fields where uh, the food is grown, so it um, in, uh, uh, interacts with the soil microbial community and then the wash from the agriculture field again might enter the stream. The other way direct the other direction that the water can flow is that let us say the, the irrigation is practiced here then the soil microbial community comes and becomes part of the um, surface water and then we have definitely another practice of manure application. So, in India we use gober whether it is cow manure or buffalo manure and we use them for um, fertilizing our field and it is really a good application of otherwise solid waste. So, it is really nice and, um, and upon manure application when we have when we wash by irrigation or if there is a rain then that again enters the watershed that again enters the surface water. So, the surface water when it comes to agriculture will definitely get sourced from animal that directly interact with surface water and the agricultural activities that we have. And then the microbial community in this surface water would have some components that match uh, animal fecal matter, some will that match uh, um, dairy animal fecal matter and some will match humans and other things too. Alrighty, so because each watershed is very unique, not every watershed is in touch with agriculture, not every watershed has fecal uh, contribution of animals and manure, but some of them have industrial sources of uh, microbes that come in or contaminants that come in affect the microbial communities in the water. Sometimes it is predominantly human. For example, in cities such as NCR, the NCI region or even in Kanpur and major cities of India lot of untreated sewage is directly released into the surface water and when that happens it affects the microbial community in the surface water. So, in surface water we will have pathogens that are um, that can that are found in human fecal matter we will see lot of gut micro uh, biome there already. So, because the there is immense diversity in the human activities and yeah, mostly human activities and also the geographical location, the surrounding the environment of the water body. We notice that the water, uh, we notice that the water uh, microbiome from different surface water can be very different. For and notice here, this is the soil microbial community. Here we have the open or coastal ocean microbial community, and here we have a uh, Ches Chesapeake Bay in northeastern America, and then we have other lakes here. So, they are different from each other, some of them are very similar, for example, these are very similar, these are very similar, but we notice that usually um, the oceans, the uh, open oceans will or coastal ocean would 
cluster together the deep ocean would be little different from them the soil would be very distinct and some lakes might be same some might be very different so the reason for difference could be the geography and the human activities around them the similarity is just because of their ecosystem the kind of geography they have the kind of water that they have you know the salty water the less salty water the deep ocean so uh, no light no oxygen very different chemistry very different functions very different microchemistry and soil completely different place so what we notice is that the environment of the aquatic water system even now here we are talking about two surface water bodies ocean and lake salty not so salty different limiting nutrients and they have very different distinct microbial communities and then so we notice that there's a lot of diversity we cannot generalize and say surface water bodies will have these microbes in fact we'll have to profile the microbes and get an idea of okay this is what we are seeing for example the coastal ocean in newport virginia is very different from the in charleston north carolina so these are very different from each other even though they are the similar environment coastal ocean environment and that's why we need to profile and make less blanket statements about ecosystem or who is present already so now let's look here at this beautiful diagram uh, and this diagram is for me a very good representation of human activities and the impact of human activities so here we have a sewage treatment plant they're throwing an effluent in the river river rhine then we have another um, drinking water treatment plant that is taking the water in through river bank filtration so in this surface water body it had some initial microbial community and when it received the sewage effluent its microbial community changed because it received the coliforms from the sewage and um, depending on how if, uh, good operation of the sewage treatment plant was the input of microbial community would be very different so here we have a very different microbial community than we had here the other thing is now when the water works the water treatment plant is taking in the water it's taking in through bank filtration which is basically river bank filtration we'll briefly talk about it uh, later if you have not already done so so in river bank filtration we allow the water to percolate into the ground and then we dig a well near the river and we take the water from the river so it has been filtered by the soil so now the water that we'll take after it undergoes filter filtration from river bed river bank we will have different microbial community than is present here because lot of the microbes will be filtered out lot of the soil microbes will percolate and find their way and then finally when we treat the water and send it to district drinking water system very different microbial community would happen and one of the interesting thing is we might assume we might believe that disinfection will remove all the microbes but we know now it does not right so some particular kind of uh, disinfectant might uh, kill one part of one kind of population better than it does another so some microbial community differences will emerge after disinfection also after treatment and disinfection so we notice that both the kind of environment we are living in ocean environment versus soil environment versus lake environment and the human activities like shown on the right panel and uh, affected represented by the difference in the coastal ocean charleston and coastal ocean coastal ocean newport virginia now this is a picture from chennai a very beautiful city by the way and this is a major wetland right in middle of chennai uh, unofficially it receives most of the toxic waste of the city so the lead levels level of other heavy metals level of antibiotics pharmaceuticals antibiotic resistance is extremely high in this lake so you can assume that the kind of ecosystem that you would have in this lake is very different from a relatively pristine uh, lake that that you can expect from a relatively pristine lake so here we might have lot of antibiotic antimicrobial resistant microbes growing and we might have microbes that can resist the uh, the damaging effects of heavy metals and other xenobiotics the antibiotics are chemicals that otherwise should not be there in this lake and we notice that because the nutrient level is very high we have lot of excessive vegetation growth in this wetland and that and and that's not really healthy for the wetland in the long run but it is one of the side effect of the extreme um human interference with environment all right now uh, talking of human interference with environment uh, we have a phenomena called sand mining pretty rampant in many parts of our country definitely i know about north india it is very rampant so notice how human activities such as sand mining so if i'm mining sand of a river let's say river ganga because i'm recording this lecture in a gangetic plain so in the, if i'm doing sand mining even the fact that i'm mining the sand near the river will change the um, will change the microbial communities in the river 
So here I have uh, the bottom sediment, so the which is being mined, the sand microbial community, and here I have um, control where there is no mining. So we notice in the surface that uh, the diversity, so y axis is giving you an idea of diversity, it says here number of OTUs which are operational taxonomic unit. So operational taxonomic unit are when we do, when we have not profiled or annotated the microbial community, not given it particular name, then we can just say okay, they, they, we have these many different kinds of OTUs. Now OTUs might be different species, different strains, we do not know, but we decide on a percentage difference in the genetic uh, sequences and that is the number of OTUs. So the more OTUs you have, the more diversity you have. So we notice that the diversity in surface water when there is sand mining is different when there is no sand mining. So when there is sand mining it increases the diversity and one of the very simple reason is when you are doing sand mining you are disturbing the otherwise stable bed of the river. Now let us look at the middle water and middle water is the other way around. Middle water of a river middle, we are talking from depth okay, surface, middle and deep. So in the middle we have more diversity when there is no sand mining and in the deep it does not make a difference. So remember sand mining happens near the surface. So basically what this is suggesting is that um, the microbial effect, the effect on the microbial ecosystem, microbial microbiology of the river would be most uh, near the surface um, due to sand mining. So it is not just the diversity but if you look at different kinds of microbes that survive, we notice that, um, so here SM is sand mining in surface plus middle, microbial communities from surface plus middle and control is no sand mining. So if you look carefully at this diagram, you will notice that there are differences. So in basically we can summarize that human activities, geography, chemistry within aquatic systems of definitely surface water will affect what kind of microbes survive, thrive and uh, how close and distinct they are to each other. Now another feature of surface water is algal blooms. So if there are algal blooms and this is a picture from again I think Chennai where we have pretty good algal blooms growing here, the dissolved oxygen in daytime is very high up to 14 milligram per liter, I have measured it. Now one of the side effect of this algal water is that even despite the high DO is that um, some algae produce really bad toxins, so these are some chemicals produced by some algae and these are all toxic to us. So we do not want to have the algotoxin and here we have a brief diagram showing about how the harmful algal bloom finally affects humans. So what we humans do is we um, mess up the nutrient levels and we allow the harmful algal blooms to happen. They are eaten up by zooplankton which are eaten by fish larva, benthic larva. Benthic system is by the way the sediment system, deep deep uh, water body system. They are eaten by other crabs, mussels and scallops and they enter and they also enter the, the toxins, the algal bloom enter the microbial food web. They are eventually from zooplankton, they go to planktivorous fish which eat the zooplankton and then seavorous fish which eat, is the fish which eat other fishes and these are eaten by birds which can be eaten by humans or the fishes are directly eaten by humans or the fishes are eaten by other marine mammals. So it affects the marine mammals, we do not usually eat marine mammals but if we do then it will affect humans. And then, um, so this is how the harmful algal boom, we do not have to drink the water but even if we eat the fish it might affect us. Um, all right students, so um, today we will end with the algal blooms and in the next class we will talk briefly more about the aquatic system and then move out, move on and cover the other portions of uh, ecology and um, with the next lecture we will be done with the microbial ecology and then we will go ahead and we will start tackling real world environmental challenges and the applied environmental microbiology aspect of them. So that is all for today, thank you very much.